What's happening, everybody? It's your man, Michael Andrew, with a very exciting guest, Maddie Goldberg, a nerd who never fit in, survived the brain tumor at 20 that made things worse, stand-up comedian. Uh, he wants to connect with everybody, and he breaks, he breaks down comedy, the biggest fears, the biggest tragedies in life, and how to overcome all of this. His book is called Brain Humor. I highly recommend it. It was a fantastic interview. I know you're going to love it. Uh, share it, like it, and keep on spreading the word, guys. We're, we're killing it. We're going to be producing a really, really high quality, high quantity of podcast in the upcoming 2015 only to get you better and uh, those inspirational stories will lead you into your own inspirational story so enjoy Do you there must have been a moment in your life that you made this decision that there was uh what was the, what was the most important decision you made um not even just to be a stand-up but after possibly and we're going to keep talking about the book brain humor yeah. where you, you had a brain tumor very young yeah so I what lessons have we learned that you? Well, could I think share? it was the, the part in the book about my mother when uh, I think it was the most one of the most important parts of the book when I was thinking about doing something like this, you know, but I never had the guts. Like a lot of us, we think about like we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, but you know, a lot of people just they don't do it. They just go, "I would love to do this." And my mom, she was a big fan of The Sopranos, mm -hmm. and she was like, you know, every weekend I'm entertained by the show. And in life, there's those that are enter you know, that entertain and those that are entertained. And she I always wanted to be a writer, and I never had the guts to do it, and I regret it. And I heard that, and I was like, you know, the, the, the idea of stand-up was in my head. I was like, shit, I, I don't want to do that, you know, 30 years from now. I don't want to go, I should have done that, you know. So I was like, okay, I got to do it, you know. It's like, I don't want to regret it. I mean, I could have failed really bad, but at least I tried, you know. Yeah, well, they they always say if uh, you only fail if you don't try to do it, and yeah. I think you succeeding. I'm I'm interested in that story. Um, your mother told you this. Uh, did you overhear that? Was she giving you a direct life lesson? No, she was just she was just in the kitchen, and my it was like a, a day of my I was there with my older sister and my dad. She was just in the kitchen, and she was just talking, and I could see it was she was really sad. Just really, it was hurting her really bad in the sense of like thinking about like I wanted to do something creative and I just never had the guts. And you know, I'm I'm sitting here regretting it all these years later. So it was more like just just her just breaking down. And she's not she's a very quiet person, so she never really, you know, she never really talks much about her life. So to hear that, it's like wow, this really you know this really affected her. You know, like not taking that chance pretty insane what you take do you remember how old you were yeah i was 24 20 no 23 22 okay. so i was just i had a little like i was going to see my friend do amateur shows at the time and i was like hey maybe i should try this and then i would get really nervous and i go no i can't do it there's no way i can do this i'll you know and then i heard that and then i it was just it just wasn't something that just switched like all right you got to try it the, do the nerves ever go away, or, or are they driving you? Nerves like being nervous to go on stage? Yeah, or... or do you look for something that raises the, the nerve stake? Like you do a bunch of stand up, you're getting comfortable. I always, I'm always nervous like right before I go up, and then as soon as I'm up there, I feel really comfortable. I think when you go up and you're confident is when you, you go down. You always have to have a, a, some sort of self-doubt or like, you know, it's like you never like, kind of master it's mm -hmm. like just keep going and you grow and you grow like i think even like willie ck will probably be better in two years than he is now and he's one of the best so he's still like learning and growing so uh there's always the nerves and always self-doubt and it's always like i have a you know routine i do for the day before the show and it's like you know whether there's six people or 300 the same routine at the same intensity do you, you so you don't modify it based on who's in the audience do you sometimes check out their energy and feel like you're going to tweak it for a particular audience um well i mean obviously i you know like we all feed on the, the better the crowd the more we feed and sometimes you know 10 great people just as good as like 200 and different people 
but like, actually, I did a show last night in the valley for ten people, and I told a story. And this is like, I was, I'm a big music fan, so uh, I was watching uh, Rat behind the music. I don't know if you're familiar with the band Rat. Yeah, I know. They're not the greatest band in the world, but they had a good story. The the singers, like I, I saw, I saw Van Halen when they first started in L.A. and they were playing in front of six people, and they were like jumping up and down and like just. They were just playing like their lights out. And it was like they knew like they were preparing themselves for something bigger. Like, you know, they were like it didn't matter how many people were in the crowd. Like we're we're going to be bigger and we're preparing ourselves for something bigger. and We're going to give those six people the best show they've ever seen. So I feel like a lot of comics will just like go through the motions and kind of just like this sucks. I'm like I'm here to like. You know, I'm here to destroy you, ten people. I'm here to give you guys the best show that you're. You'll be glad that you guys came out tonight. That's the right attitude. That's the, I find that to be uh, like something you can carry over into almost every other task in the world. Where it's oh, like, absolutely. But it's yeah. hard for you for. Is it hard for you personally to do that in every single task, or do you, you basically have a couple outlets where you're performing at that level? Um. Well. I mean, there was times that I was foolish where uh, I would sit and mope and complain about things, you know? Like, I would go, oh, I'm doing this for eight years and there's six people in the crowd. What the fuck is going on in my life? And uh, I don't know, did you read the whole book or? Yes. Okay, so like my buddy Angelo, who passed, but he was this great comic. I mean, I saw the way his his energy was for six people and I saw his energy for doing crappy open mics and I realized like it's a gift it's 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 a gift to go up there and it, it's like every time I go up there it's it's awesome but a lot of guys a lot of guys and gals in this you know they can get very frustrated because it is up and down and and you know I've seen some of the big names go up and down and you know and uh so now I have this a very good attitude about like just every time I get to perform, it's, it's awesome. But, but Matt, there... Matty, I don't want to interrupt you, but why is that? You said earlier that Louis C.K., in two years, you believe he'll be better. And yeah. there's other comedians that uh, they it falls off a cliff. Um, maybe that's a choice they make, but is I feel like maybe it's a part of being humbled. Louis C.K. Think, will take the humbling. I think we well, hear the thing. A lot of people are in this for different reasons. Mm-hmm. A lot of comics are in this for, for fame. A lot of comics are in it for revenge. A lot of comics are in it to get laid. Um, there's all types of motivation. And with a lot of guys that fall off the cliff, their motivation is not necessarily like to be the best of their craft or this or that. Their motivation is to be the top, the top dog, number one. And that is where a lot of people kind of like forget you know, what made him great and made him lovable to the crowd and stuff. So, like, I see Louis C.K. as more of a guy that just, you know, he really loves, you know, he's got a very beautiful way of venting about his life and whatnot. And uh, I, I don't see him, like, you know. Slowing there's, down. Yeah, there's another guy, Dane Cook, who I I see in L.A. a bunch, and I don't want to, you know, I don't like ripping on people, but I don't, sometimes I feel like he's not, his his motivation is not always the best motivation, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you you could see that, and I, I obviously don't know the inside track yeah. on, on those things, sure. but uh, you know, hearing maybe rumored that he would just set that, maybe set he wanted it to kill every single time. Um, one crazy thought I had about well, it's not even crazy, but if you're like you love comedy, you're, yes. you're watching comedians, right? Sure. Yeah. How do you not completely? Uh, when we had Jimmy Schubert on, he was mm-hmm. saying he can't watch sets anymore only because he doesn't want to get even influenced at all. Do you feel like that's a problem in comedy? Ah, uh, yeah. I don't really watch. I watch some. I'll watch people I've never seen for like. Unfortunately, the way you're judging this and it's really awful. But a veteran comic will watch you for like thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. All need is like to watch you one joke, and then I'll think like either you got it or you don't. So I can watch something for like 30 seconds and I'll be like, oh, they don't got it. Or, wow, this person's really good. But I really stopped watching it uh, because, I don't know, I just, I've, 
I've, I lived it, eat, eating it for so long. It's just like, you know, I, I've, I, it's, it doesn't that suck. I, yeah. Sometimes. I mean, there's I, David tell is somebody I'll watch forever though. Yeah. David tell, I, I can watch anytime, any place, anywhere. There's some guys that are just like above that, but like, I still, when I first started, I mean, I watched so much stand up. I studied everything. Like, you know, I studied how comics would walk on stage to how, like, when a joke doesn't work, how do they go to the next joke to win the crowd back to little tricks to keep the crowd going? You know, I mean, there's um, like a momentum you have to keep. Like, how do they keep that momentum going? You know, so I like studied so much. So now it's just like, all right, I kind of develop my own style, my own persona, my own thing. I, I I don't know how much more I can learn, but I do like if somebody's new and they say, oh, this guy's really funny, check him out. I'm always like, okay. But I don't really watch a lot of, like, I don't watch a lot of stand-up. Who, who did you watch early on? Who's your... well, I love David Tell. Uh, this guy, Greg Rogel. Mm -hmm. You know, ever heard of him? Yes. So he's amazing. I, I learned to write jokes, like, through, he was great because he used so few words. Mm-hmm. We do different stuff. Like he's observational. I pretty much talk about myself, but like, I was so amazed by the 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 the, the, uh, the very few words he used to get such great laughter. You know, he could do a joke and have six words, and it would be a killer. And I was like, all right, you got to shorten everything. You got to get right to the point. You got It's all in the timing. It's all in the selling of the of the facial expression. So that was the guy, Todd Barry. I used to love watching uh, Mark Maron sometimes. Uh, you know, uh, Patrice O'Neill was really interesting. Bill Burr. I mean, I, I worked at a comedy club, so I got to watch all these guys on the weekend, and they would just slaughter. And you just see all the tricks that they have. Nice. And it basically, um, you have a wide variety of, of humor taste, it sounds like. Yeah. It sounds like you pretty much uh, watching just about everybody uh, growing up, at least. Matty, you're your last time or, or forget about any, any of that when you yep. have somebody that is in the crowd that is disruptive say a heckler yeah um, do you have particular uh not even comebacks but is there a trick or is there a methodology to dealing with that well i've never i've i just had recently had a heckler so i'll tell you the story real quick yes please but uh i always feel like because i'm self-deprecating that anything i say about myself is going to be better than anybody in what the crowd will say about me so I never, it never bothered me. And also, if I get angry, if they, if they piss me off, I can be very funny when I'm angry. And it doesn't, people don't assume that I'll be angry. So it comes off interesting or, or for, you know, it's, I'm never like worried about hacklers, but, uh, I was, uh, doing a show in, in the Huntington Beach, which is like a lot of drunks. It's a very drinking, it's like a, a strip of just bars. Mm -hmm. and this guy starts yelling at me that I'm doing, um, stealing all of Mitch Hedberg's jokes, mm -hmm. which is bizarre because I just did like five minutes on my brain, my brain tumor, my brain. So it's like, you know, and, and like, I love Mitch Hedberg and I, I mean, I don't even, I only know two of his jokes and he's clean and I'm kind of dirty. You know, I, you know, so there's no, like, there's no, there's no fucking whatever, you he know, an extremely distinctive, method of delivery yeah. jokes yeah he's a distinct like uh cadence and rhythm and everything and i'm totally not i just talk about myself you know mm -hmm. so that pissed me off because it was like a it was a hard crowd and i was doing really good and i was working really hard to get to people you know and like to, to accuse somebody of that is like you know accusing like a baseball player of taking steroids yeah. like the lowest the low so i flipped out i, I walked off stage and i I told him to go listen, man. I, uh, you know, I'll give you my CD. I'll, a lot of these jokes are on YouTube. You find one joke Mitch Hedberg did, and that I and that I did, and I'll give you a fucking thousand dollars. You know, so like, I got in the guy's face, and you know, uh, it got heated, and they threw him out. But it that was like that 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 was my my breaking point, being accused of that. You know, that that was the worst thing he could. Do you think he knew that was like one of the things that would set you off? Because he couldn't I get think, anything else. I think he was so probably drunk, he didn't even know what he was doing. I think he'll probably regret it in the morning. But uh, a lot of times, you know, you go to these towns and there's locals. And, you know, you go there and all the girls are laughing. And, you know, it's like, who the fuck is this guy coming into my bar? Yeah. 
you know, so it's kind of that kind of mentality. So you got you got to be pretty brave to uh, put yourself <laughs> through this. I mean, it, this could happen all the time. Yeah, sure. I mean, it it can it certainly you know is a part of uh, you know stand up. Uh, Does it bring actually, your energy level up a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it brings my blood up. It brings my you know. I don't want to go to those places though. I hate going to those angry places. But like. You know, when I'm challenged, you know, I'm going to fight back. I mean, I actually have more problems when I started with other veteran comedians kind of being bullies. Uh, that was a big problem when I started. You know, they, 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 it was kind of like where you, you know, there's hazing and they show up and they're like, how much is this person going to take and keep coming back, you know? So that was a bigger, you know, that was bigger than any other, you know, heckler or anything like that. So you're saying other comics were bullying you worse than the hecklers? Yeah. When you start out, yeah, they're they're kind of like, you know, it's kind of like seeing who, what you have, you know, what, you know, there's, there's a whole different, I mean, a lot of comedy is off the stage, it's, you know, networking and whatnot, and being friends with the right people and, you know, you know, all that other jazz and, you know, that's part of the game and, you know, when you start out, you know, there's a lot of guys and they want to break you, you know. Wow. Okay. What? <laughs> You gotta go through I'm, some I'm, stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like giving the ins and outs. But I'm, you know, it's just... no, it's good. I think a lot of people are interested. Even if you don't do comedy, uh, I feel like a lot of things that I do, which are not even nearly in the same field, but I teach a kickboxing class, right? So we have a hundred people in class. There'll be brand new people, and at times you'll have even hecklers in that. They'll. Uh, oh yeah, I can imagine. And it becomes. When I was like 11 years old, I took karate, and this kid would just beat the shit out of me. I would, I would just like step out of my mom's car, and this kid would just fucking put me in a headlock, and, you know. So what do you think that is? I mean, when especially when they're doing it as adults. Oh, adults, it's really sad because there's a tremendous amount of fear and uh, insecurity. Like I always told when when a young, I mean, I'm I'm really good with young comics. They always, you know, come to me for advice, and I always like, you know. I'm honest. I give them, you know, I'm, I'm brutally honest, so I'll be honest with them. But, like, you know, they'll tell me that, like, some guy, you know, gave him a shitty introduction or was a dickhead to him. And uh, I always, like, say, you know, well, just my comeback would be, like, you know, when Jim Carrey was at this comedy club, was he working on his act or was he, like, bullying guys that have been doing comedy for a year, you know? Like, mm-hmm. a, lot of those, a lot of the guys that do that are very insecure, you know? So they... they they fear anybody that's coming up and they there's a lot of fear because it's you know stage time is scarce and it's like you know it's it's not always there all the time you can lose it fast yeah it's crazy the whole comedy club setup uh it 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 seems like actually they should put them in like marijuana dispensaries instead of bars oh yeah i mean it's uh you know it's 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 ruthless so do you think, uh, I, I mean, do you think it's going to change? Do you think the next 10, 20 years, we're not going to be watching comedy in the same spots? Where I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of comedy. I don't want to get, I mean, I'm always honest, but like I'm afraid of comedy because it's become so divided into such small categories. Mm-hmm. And what was not comedy is now comedy. Mm-hmm. So like I love the idea of like, like if you like boxing, it's like guy in trunks and boxing gloves, and that's it. Two guys in the ring and a referee, mm-hmm. you know. And stand up to me is like that. It's like a microphone. You got a comic and you got an audience, and that's it. And nowadays, other things are like comedy that I don't really consider comedy. What like what? There's a guy who's is uh, successful. Who did something where he had a he rented an airplane and he fucking had like a the punchline and smoke or something like mm-hmm. written out and smoke or something or you know something weird like that or you know but it's it, it, bizarre stuff like that they don't really consider comedy or stand up but they come from they, they're stand up comedians but they do weird stuff like that you know oh, oh, I don't know that story is that, yeah is that a real story oh, there's all these shows too where like you know naked comedy or you know weird con- you know like theme shows i'm not into theme shows i'm like we're funny enough that we can just go up there and do our thing we don't need to kind of have a silly theme show to like 
get people to be interested in what we do. Yeah, it's in, it's that is the purest form. That's the toughest comedy there is. Uh, you you also act though as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not the greatest actor, but you know, any chance I can get. What do you like to do? Well, I love to act, but I know you know no De Niro, that's for sure. But you know, whenever I get a chance, uh, I pretty much am good at playing myself. And you are you are a, uh, a character. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I've done. I just did a, a small part in a movie with uh, Melanie Griffith and Eddie Izzard and a few other people. I have like a couple lines, but it's pretty cool, and you know, I'm excited about that. Uh, but like you know. I always, I'm always flattered when people ask me to be in stuff, you know. Yeah, you have, uh, you know how to work your your body on stage, without sound. Yeah, I I I understand. Uh, uh, what I learned about stand up is that it's there's so much psychology involved of being likable and using your body and your clothes you wear is important. Every every little aspect is so important to what you do and what people perceive you as. Because people are pretty much when you do stand up, they're judging you. You know, Before they're you like, get up there. the second you get up there, yeah, they're judging. They're like, this guy is this, and then your job is to be like, well, I'm this, I am that, or I am not that. So, what's the quickest way to do that? You just say something. Uh, well, I have, good op- I have a few good opening jokes I usually use that kind of establish who I am, and uh, and then I kind of go from there. I mean, the the set list is important too because you don't want to like hit them. You don't want to be too – like if you have a raunchy joke, you don't want to do that up front because then they're going to expect it the whole way through. You kind of want to like prepare them for what you're going to do and then, you know. So what, what's a, can you take us through a normal day? Because I got I to gotta expect – it doesn't seem like it would be – you're getting on stage. It's, you know, you love comedy. But yeah. it, you, you probably have a lot of open time that oh, I do. to mentally think. I, I waste a lot of time, unfortunately. Is it necessary wish, to waste time? I I wish I had that. Did you see that new Scarlett Johansson movie about she has like she has like a hundred percent of her brain? Trust me, I I see that. I, I, it's a fantasy. Yeah, I wish I used like fifty percent. I mean, I think we only use like twelve, so I would I would take twenty five. I do a lot of stupid stuff. Uh, like my hobbies are my my hobbies are bizarre. Hit us with some hobbies that are bizarre. Well, they're not really bizarre. They're just like degenerate. Well, yeah. Like I look, like I look like I should be in the comic books and superheroes. I don't know anything about any superhero, any comic book. I haven't, I haven't seen one movie about a comic book or a super. You know, I, I, that just doesn't interest me. I like sports a lot, so I watch a lot of sports. I gamble on a lot of sports. I like, you know, I like uh, cards. I like playing poker. So I basically, uh, you know, those are those are my things that kind of, you know. I can talk more about that, like gambling, than talking about comedy. That's interesting. Well, I mean, at poker, it's kind of similar. It's psychologically. Absolutely, yeah. Working. It's helped because I can read. Uh, audiences are, are like, you know, I kind of, when I go on stage, I can read, like, what they kind of, like, they want. Like, certain jokes might not work with certain crowds. Or I can just read on their faces that they're having a really good time or if they're not. So like I kind of can adjust my set to what do I what do I have to do? So there is like a lot of reading involved. Just do you, like do you do you use it in reverse. Do you at the poker tournaments? Do you uh, do you play yeah, online well, or do you play in person? I play online. I play some tournaments. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I do. Uh, you know, it's just the way people. Uh, I mean, you can tell pretty fast in poker too because some guys just you know they just throw their money around and they're just calling everything and playing bad hands and you can tell the good players who are tight and don't play a lot. But can you put that put the show on yourself? And What's that? Can you fake out the other players using you know uh, what I like to do is I mean I'm not I just uh, I'm very simple with my, my style. Like I uh I'm one of those people that like, you know, always be in the best position to win, you know? So I, I play pretty tight and I, I want people to know I play really tight and I'm not bluffing. So Later in the game, I can make a really nice big bluff. So I want to know I'm just playing right by the book, and I'm not bluffing anybody, and I'm not, you know. So I can, you know, you can, you can, you can make those bluffs at the end because they, you know, they respect you and they put you on. You know, they're always putting you on really good hands. Yeah. 
that's my style. I shouldn't say that because I hope, but I don't think anybody who uh, that, is a, that can, a, can be a bluff in itself. In, a, in a, yeah. of itself, um, I mean, I've heard crazy things. I saw a guy who said like he would go to the table and ask like, "Hey, who won that? Who won the basketball game tonight?" And then if somebody tells them, they give them like their honest answer, so he knows like their face when they're honest. You know, like they're they're just telling the truth. Oh yeah, you could definitely do that. And he, and like just getting little tells like that. But I, I, you know, some people just throw money around, and then some, you know, like all oh, their players. You know, do you they, wear sunglasses? No. Headphones? No, but I'm very quiet, and it's very odd because I don't tell anybody what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. Nobody would assume that I do that. And then there's guys that just never shut the fuck up. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Jesus Christ! They should, you know, they should try doing comedy. <laughs> you know what you should do? Well, go in a burka with sunglasses. Yeah, that would uh, that would be interesting. I don't think uh, they'd be able to read you. No, that would be that would be pretty fascinating. Um, what else you get you get into? Like, what, what uh, t- walk us through a day? What time do you I get up? I read a lot too. I read like four books at one time. I I, I read a lot of nonfiction. Mm-hmm. I read a lot of books about like interesting people. Talk to me. I love books. What do you like? Okay, so right now I, I'm a big Chuck Klosterman fan. Do you like him? No, it's the first time I'm hearing it, but I'll check it out. Oh, yeah. He just wrote a book called, uh, let me look it up. I think it's called Who Wears the Black Hat. Mm-hmm. He'll talk about villains in society and why you know people are villains and the role they play. So he talks about all these people and what makes them a lovable villain and what makes them you know hated and that fine line, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, then I read a lot of, like, I, 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 I read the uh, John, you, know, you ever seen the movie Cocaine Cowboy? Of course. So I'm reading John Roberts' memoir. Oh, that's but, gonna be fascinating. Okay. Yeah, he was—he's amazing. I mean, he, his book is interesting because he's very unapologetic, and he also hates—he hates himself, but he's unapologetic at the same time. So he's like, I am an evil person, and and uh, you know, he sees all these innocent people dying like throughout the book, and he's like, you know, what is karma? Because how am I not dead? You know, and uh, he just—he. It's very weird too because he had a, he has a son and he's kind of trying to hide his past from his son or or he, or he wants to let it out but he wants his son not to be like him which is pretty hard. I mean it, usually you end up like your dad but yeah. uh, his story is really amazing too because it's also uh, you know it's all about it was the cocaine in, in Miami and uh, just how the government you know they knew the police the government they basically knew what he was doing you know the whole time and all these like bribes and all these, you know, like giving like a million dollars to a a congressman, you know, to to keep him out of jail that the cops won't go after him and all this shit that is just insane. Yeah. It's probably still going on. Um, What made you decide to write a book? Because it's gotta be, it's a lot of, it's a ridiculous amount of effort. Okay. So, uh, I always like writing, and I, I wrote some essays maybe four or five years ago just for the hell of it about going through the brain surgery process, mm-hmm. and I just always had them. Like, I wanted to write about that. I didn't know what to do with it, but I always felt like I had an interesting story just with, like, going through all the stuff I went through and all the adventures and stand-up and all the interesting people and, like, the way I worked my way up, and... I always, I'm, I'm, I'm one for like the real fucking story, you know? Yeah, like, I, I, that's what I like. I like. I hated the movie Funny People. Mm-hmm. Cause it's about our industry. It's about like stand up comedy, but it's not real. And then you see it and it pisses you off. It's like, I, I'm in this business and I'm, you know, I'm a guy that's in the middle of struggling, but I want to see a movie or read something that's like what we really go through. And I wanted to bring that out and I want to show like this is the process, this is what it's like. You know, nobody's plucked out of obscurity. You know, it's years and years of tremendous hard work. And I also want to tell the story of my friends who passed because he was a humble guy and he was, you know, unfortunately with death, you're forgotten. And I wanted people to, like, see, like, what somebody felt about the the love and the joy of being an artist. I mean, I, I you know, living out here, there's so many people that are doing well that are so angry and frustrated and I'm like, you guys have the you guys have the best lives. You don't you don't see it. You don't get it. Pretty pretty powerful. Um, the when you when you found out 
when after you got the surgery or even yeah. before then was there a moment where you just felt like this is this was going to be it well yeah because uh the two weeks i had two weeks before i was diagnosed and then the surgery and they told me like not you know when they opened me up they don't they don't know anything mm-hmm. you know like you don't know if it's cancer they don't know how big it is they don't have treatable it's also in a dangerous spot you might be paralyzed. Now, even if we get it out, there's a good chance you'll never walk again. So for those two weeks, you know, nothing in life kind of matters in the sense of like the future, you know. It's always in the back of your mind that you, you know, you probably won't be here for a long time, you know. And then uh, to get the news that it was, that I, I, I had, the surgery was successful was pretty awesome, but I wasn't prepared for the recovery. The recovery was just brutal on my body and brutal on, you know, I mean, every day I was in pain. Man, how, how often do you think about that? Is that something? Well, I, re- I repressed it for a long time. And I also, uh, this is really hard because, because I got so much tough love and stand up. I was told right away, nobody gives a fuck. Like nobody gives a shit. You know, mm-hmm. so like you want to do something, you got to fucking do it. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough world. So for a while I repressed it. Cause I was like, I can't use it as a crutch. Nobody, you know, nobody's going to, you know, cry for me and, and shit like that. So I was like, I had that mentality for a long time, but you know, looking back now, I'm, I'm just very proud of, just trying everything I did to try, like everything I did to, to, to work hard at something, you know, put myself out there and to keep coming back, you know. I mean, the first year, the first two years of comedy, I probably bombed 50% of the time. So, like, to keep going, to be like, there's something there, there's something there, like, you know, I'm going to figure it out. Uh, and just like, you know, and, and then, you know, knowing what I went through, it's like, this is, this nothing compared to that what do you want to do in the future obviously there's dreams. you know what I, I see I, I you know I have like things like I'd love to get my stand up you know kind of like in the mainstream and seen by a lot of people and you know get more stuff on television I mean I love that but I also I've also realized you know I do a lot of these one nighters in like small towns and stuff. We get paid like a hundred, two hundred bucks, and you know it's usually a rowdier crowd. But they have, they love me, and I do great. And I'm like, if that's what that's what I'm here for, that that's awesome too. So you know, uh, I just love you know performing, and I'm a performer. So, but you know, there's things I, I want to write this screenplay for Brain Humor. Mm-hmm. I talk to people about writing a screenplay for it, and maybe write again. But you know. It's just like, you know, I have a show in a couple of days and I'll be psyched for that. And that I, you know, I don't really look too far ahead. I'll just be like, when that day comes, I'm going to give everybody the best show and, you know, go from there. So do you, um, do you edit out bits periodically as you get bored of them? Yeah. And then sometimes it's weird. Like I write a really good bit and then I forget about it and then I'm trying to do it again and I'm not capturing the magic that I once had with it. So like that's hard, but like periodically, you know, I uh, I'll move stuff around or like I'll write something and be really excited to do that, and I'll take this out. And then there's jokes that like I know the crowds would love that have never heard it, and I always want to give them like some of my best stuff as well. So, but uh, it's good. I don't. I think in the future we're gonna see. I'm sorry to interrupt, but a lot more of these ideas when you're up there on stage. If you had some kid out there that, you know, could put together a really quick uh, video and, you know, presentation of some of these joke ideas, you're basically free flowing all types of scripts. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, totally. I mean, and you have to learn, like, how do I make that funny on stage? Like, you have to cut it down. Like, you have to, you know, like, you have to cut words out. You have to get right to, like, you know, you know, you have to, you have to really condense the story. It can't be... Or else it'd be really great at telling a story. Every little part of the story has to have a punchline every six or seven seconds, which is very, like, it's, 
that takes tremendous skill. So but are you throwing? It, what's is it basically? Danny was describing it as as comedy is basically suspense, putting people in, in suspense. Is that the way you would describe it? Suspense. Why is why do people laugh? Uh okay. Well, I'll tell you two things. I used to tour in Baltimore a couple times a year. I go for like I do seven shows in three days when I lived in New York. So I go to a town like that and you go there and every time I go there, places will be closed down, you know, the economy sucked. It was a very blue collar town. And when they would go to these comedy shows, they just they wanna fucking laugh and have a good time and forget about their problems. And like and they just want to like kick back and not think about the mortgage and mm-hmm. you know, how they're going to pay these bills or what their boss sucks. And it, it's an amazing escape. It, it, it's almost like horror movies in a sense where people go to horror movies because they go, well, I don't have it so bad, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a great cathartic way to escape and to, you know, I used to think I was, you know, I had a friend who was a doctor in New York he really liked me and I was dizzy one day and he took me in and I was like, geez, what you do for people? And he, and he was like, I would do anything to do what you do. And, you know, he's making $100,000 on making no money. And you realize, like, what the, the beautiful thing of what making people laugh is. It's a very, it's a tough skill and it's, it's much appreciated. People really need to laugh. Like, even after September 11th, like, a year after seeing New York in the comedy clubs, and they were they were booming then. There was this very very need for people in New York to like, you know, forget about things. Well, never, you know, not forget, but just like, you know, we're still gonna enjoy our lives and be entertained and enjoy, you know, laughing and, and being free and whatnot. And uh, you know, the the crowds are very thankful. Oh yeah, it, New York needs comedy. We need lots of comedy. Yeah, and New York is the mecca of comedy. I will say that. You think so? Yeah, I think it's a little bigger than L.A. I think it's better than the comics are better in New York than L.A. Uh, it is it is the capital of comedy. But everything, why is there such a, I mean, everybody's in L.A. The, the TV industry and the movie industry is in L.A. So, like, they chase the big bucks out here. But, like, pay your dues in New York. And they're, the crowds in LA are easier too because New York, you get a lot of tourists from like Europe and stuff and other countries and they don't really get your American, you know, you gotta like, they don't get a lot of the references sometimes. But out here, it's like everybody's like from California and they're just like living, you know, they're, they live, it's February, it's 70 degrees and they're living in paradise. So, you know, it's just like, yeah, fun, you know? It's tough to, uh, to gauge the references and it's probably getting a lot tougher. Yeah, I when I come back to New York, I have to remember like a lot of people here, you know, might not know what I'm talking about when I do this joke or that joke. So I gotta like adjust. Uh, Maddie, we always ask this question on the podcast sure. or just yeah. a what would you say to a younger version of yourself? Hopefully, a lot of these listeners are are younger kids, uh, yeah. trying to find their way through the world. Like, looking, we have people from a lot of different professions you're in good company because sure. tomorrow we have a physicist on whose awesome. his name is david goldberg awesome <laughs> he might be related great no i uh well i my biggest regret personally is that i was a little i always had a little chip on my shoulder and assumed people didn't like me and that held me back mm-hmm. and i wish earlier in my career in stand-up i was a little more like just you know, just not, you know, I just, not, you know, I kept to myself a lot. I wish I was more social with the other comics and whatnot and, and just like, a, you know, didn't have like this thing that everybody hated me and everybody would have to get. Me. I would say to younger people, the best advice and what I've learned is that like, if you're doing what you love to do, you're winning, you know, mm-hmm. no matter what the results are now, you're still winning and that's like the biggest gift of life is, is uh, doing what you love to do. I mean, it's awesome. So, a lot of people, I, I mean, I guess the biggest gift I can get when I was in New York, and I, I worked at an animal hospital when I did stand up, and it was a joy to get out of that animal hospital. I never had to work there again. 
Mm. But I remember I would go there early in the morning and I would see people, you know, running to the subway to get to their job at like, you know, eight or seven in the morning. And they're like running. And I'm like, they're running to a job they hate at eight in the morning. Yeah, you're constantly on a schedule here. Yeah, and I'm like, how, how can you live like that? So people assume that they have to, you know, they have to do the right thing, and, which is not the right thing. But they have to like have a job, and you know, they, but just like you know, figure it out and whatever you love to do, do it. It's it's the best thing in the world. Hell yeah! Well, uh, I, if uh, if I can make only one recommendation is Maddie, we got to get this book uh, on an audio book. I was telling me that I'd love to do it. I just, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out everything about it. Uh, I would love to do it. I'm gonna find out. And you could have people play the parts and talk like uh, when Danny that's, comes on. That's really cool. I mean, I always wanted to do like some of the some of the times when I was dealing with some of the kind of veteran gruff bullies talking to me. I would love to have them come back and do the voices and stuff yeah, like that. That would be fantastic. But uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on it. I appreciate that. I mean, I think it would make a good movie if I kind of I don't know how I would I would probably change the order around the book, but I think it would be a good it would be a good movie. I don't know. Yeah, they might tear oh. it apart though, Maddie. You can let him do that. Yeah, well. You're gonna have yeah, Tom Cruise play part. you. What's that? Are you gonna have anybody play you in the movie? Let's see. Uh, you gotta play it. Leo, definitely Leo. Leo, that would be pretty pretty epic yeah but i think you should do it yourself so where can they go how can they they follow you uh well twitter i'm not the biggest twitter guy but i do i update my shows on twitter maddie at maddie goldberg one i know it's not very creative uh facebook and then maddiegoldberg.com the book is on amazon or you can buy it through my website it's a little more on my website but i will personally sign anything i will sign the book and i'll write anything you want me to write on it I'm sorry, I would have gotten it from your site, but oh no worries, it uh, I, it means a lot. You bought it and you liked it, and but I'm at over dot com, and uh, um, I'll be in New York in October. Awesome, where? Well, I'm doing a, a casino in Yonkers, okay. and then I what I do is I'll set together like a week of shows. So I know New York Comedy Club has me like headline a night, and what I do is I'll book a few of my buddies that I started with and it'll be kind of like a cool night so i'll definitely let all you know yeah actually you should we, we'll call you back right before yeah. then oh that means the world thank you there's the hoboken comedy festival uh, yeah i have a lot of people from hoboken obviously on this sure. and it's in october i'll find out when i don't know uh that would be fantastic if we could bring you down to hoboken yeah yeah uh i i never yeah. you know, never been to hoboken i hear i hear it's building up though yeah, it's good. We're not going to, it's not like Baltimore, uh, but you know, for the, for the comedy, we don't have a comedy club in town. So when we have a comedy festival, it's, it's packed. Yeah. You know, people want to laugh. Uh, we would love to come out. We'll support. Trust me. Yeah, we're gonna push this book. I'll hit somebody up out there to, to uh, do a show. All right. I love coming to New York. I, I, it's a great, it's always great to be back. I, there's people I just love seeing and you know, for some reason, I've been really embraced by the other comics. But I always like because I'm an idiot, and I always think everybody hates me. And then last time I came back, everybody was just so like nice and cool, and it meant it. Uh, it just felt it felt really cool. We, we we support New Yorkers. Yeah, New Yorkers are they are the they're like I say out here. It's like uh, you know, you go to your, like your restaurants in your neighborhood, and you don't know anybody who works there, like. You know, when I lived in Brooklyn, everybody, you know, I'd go there every night. Yeah. I was like, yo, how was the show tonight? You know, and then you do busted balls, you bust it back. And, you know, there's, it's not like that out here. That's a one, one drawback from L.A., but you got the weather. Yeah, we do have the weather, that's for sure. Listen, Matty, I will, uh, I'm going to let you go. The book, I thank you, Michael. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate this. And we will we'll call you back and uh, we'll get all the stuff out there. We're going to push this right. thing like crazy. I appreciate it. And also, uh, send me the when it's out. I'll, I'll definitely post it on everything. You're the man. Well, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, okay? You too, Matty. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.